Today's Maverick Sports Podcast guest has run a successful publishing company, has a master's degree in creative writing, a law degree, an MBA, and has written two novels. But that's just one part of John Dobson's story. In another life, he has coached UCT to the Varsity Cup title, won a Vodacom Cup and Curry Cup as head coach of Western Province, as well as guiding Western Provinces under 21s to two national titles. He has had a stint in Italy and is currently head coach of the Stormers in Super Rugby. His mother still asks when he's going to get a real job, but Dobson is a self-confessed rugby romantic and sees coaching not only as teaching young players how to become better at their jobs and to win matches and titles, but also how to become better human beings. I'm Craig Gray, and it's a great pleasure to welcome one of rugby's true gentlemen onto the show today. How's it, John? How's it, Craig? Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. How's lockdown treating you? We're all sitting in lockdown, and uh, I guess it's very frustrating for a, a coach in the middle of a Super Rugby campaign to be in lockdown. Yeah, I mean, we put so much into like every team. We put so much into the season now because remember, Curry Cup finished so early. So from the end of August, we were sort of thinking about Super Rugby, and now it's the carpets that are being whisked from under us. So it is it is, it is frustrating. Um, the guys are left without a sense of meaning, and there's just so no, obviously across the world, no certainty about anything. You we know, win, and if we play again, so. It's very disruptive. Um, trapped at home, I think. They, what do they call it? Stockholm syndrome. When you start to love your kidnappers, <laughs> my wife. <laughs> no, she kind of. <laughs> it's very tough. On I suppose everyone's got different circumstances, and I guess most of us that are on this platform are, are probably luckier than than many yeah. in terms of how we are are in lockdown. So I suppose. Is that something you've tried to get through to the players as well? What What did you say to them before lockdown? What was your sort of parting message to them? Um, I think the, well, uh, we, what I definitely said to them was our chance for them to become better. Um, not really us as a team, because that's that's something we have to do in the team environment. But just as as athletes, they can't just this, they can't just Netflix this time away. Hey, we're not good enough as regular good players. We've all got time. You know, I've got improvements to make as a coach, and they've all got deficits. We call them deficits. As players, so they've got to work on their deficits, obviously the basic S and C stuff, but then to try and do something they're never going to do nor in their normal lives, whether that is you know doing a cooking course, uh, learning how to work Microsoft Excel, doesn't matter. Uh, just to, just not for you know just not to serve time and to come back a better. So we we're sort of monitoring that as best we can. Yeah, and it can't be easy, but uh, uh, I think. We saw early in this year, there's definitely a good atmosphere and a good spirit in the team, and that's from the outside looking in. Um, uh, and do you feel that this group of players grasps that, you know, it, they're more than rugby players in this? They, they are going to have to set an example whether they like it or not. Yeah, I think I think some of the younger chaps, you know, it's part of the, we know our school systems are big bailout in South African rugby. It's also, you know, if you're a star rugby player, I think to a large degree, you're relatively what's the word Rusty uses, entitled, you know, so they, um, the real world is maybe a di- bit distance. Mm. Um, but actually, and not, not surprising, and maybe it's cliche, but the guy who really has taken the mantle is Sia. Because I think, you know, given he's petrif- you know, he's literally petrified of what the damage can be done in the township. So he's been really squeezing the group with some able lieutenants like Dylan Lates and then to say, listen, this, we can't just sit in the trenches, you know, it's, 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 it, we get it. Change, sorry, I mean bunker down, not fight. Yeah. We're gonna to have to engage. So the guy we've got a we've got a few projects, you know, we're working with Pick and Pay on Feed the Nation. Another one I'm sure we'll get to. And they um they the, their job is to try and use the profiles that they have uh to to, to sort of get the message across. Because we need this lockdown to be as short as possible. While we're on that, uh Dobber, uh Sia has grown into an amazing leader. I mean, he's been Stormer's captain now for a few years, but yes. um, it, it just seems like he's, he's he's taken it another level up. Have you felt that as well? Yeah, completely. You know, I thought, you know, um, you know, from the outside in, because I wasn't part of the Springbok camp, campaign, you know, things, as, as happens to every World Cup winning team and captain, you know, things sort of fell into place for him, you know, and the team. I mean, it happens in every World You can go to any World Cup and be the same story. Mm. It happened in 1995. And the, 2007, there you were know, a couple of teams that dropped out or weren't good enough. But it um, doesn't take anything away from the winners. But what I've seen over the last while is an incredible um, understanding of his responsibility, you know, nationally. And that's why this, this this COVID thing is sort of, you know, resonating. And he's actually behaving so well. And, he, and the, the growth in his professionalism is unbelievable because, you know, I wouldn't cope with the demands on him. You know, we went on camp in, in wilderness in, at, at the end of uh, last year, just before Christmas. And the players will get out of here. There's Peter Steff, who's world player of the year, and Stephen Kutzoff and Franz Maherber and Herschel Jainkees is a big, you know, massive person in the Western Cape. But it was a, they weren't on the same role in this year. You know, when people were, when we stopped at the petrol, the one stop or whatever, you, to get, you know, guys go and buy a snack, 
the, the, the petrol pump attendants would stop putting petrol in mm. and the guys in the cars wouldn't mind because it was sear. I mean, the, the, t- <laughs> the cash would just, would just start ululating. <laughs> it was incredible. You know, one, and, and the selfies just don't stop, you know. So um, it's another realm he's in, but I think he's grafted incredibly maturely, you know. Yeah, he has. And, uh, you know, he's doing so much good work with his foundation. But that's a story for another day. And I'm, I have actually um, asked here to come on at some point. So hopefully he will join us and we can talk about all those things. But just, uh, Dabo, before we get to your current setup, uh, let's just go back a little bit. You, you're a man steeped in not only rugby tradition, but certainly Western province rugby tradition. I mean, you come from yeah. a Western province rugby family. Um, yeah. Just just give us a little bit uh, to the listeners, a bit of your background and your history with rugby in Western province. My father was kind of established rugby historian and mm. he was very good friends with Doc Craven. And they, um, I think he wrote one of Doc Craven's biographies and they collaborated on a few projects, um, uh, especially in the, 19, in, the, in the 80s about sort of, um, reaching out to other communities, and but it was within the paradigm of the old South African rugby board, not the so unified one in those days. And then um, he was a referee, and he was a Curry Cup referee, and yes, he's strict about it. You know the, the infallibility of the Pope and the and the bloody referee. And I can't say anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you still give you a hard time to these to this day, yeah. if you <laughs> Craig, you've got no idea. I can't go in and say, listen, Maurice Yonker got that wrong. Just, nah. Nah, he it's never the ref. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I would go along with him to re- refereeing places like Tramways and Epping and obviously onto Villages, uh, all the clubs. And I'd go with him to every game pretty much. And then Northeastern Cape, which is all one of the old sport PNR unions and Northwestern Cape and all those sort of things. And then um, every Saturday at Newlands, three club games. Uh, so I grew up in the scholars stand there pretty much at Newlands from when I was five or six. And then it just became... But what was nice about my dad is that he... Um, he sort of educated me to understanding that there were two rugby bodies or no more, it's obviously, but yeah, you know, there were two schools of thought, you know, one of them was a SACOS at no normal sports and at normal society. Yeah. And of course, the establishment which I was growing up in, which obviously I was very, very passionate about, you know, Western province in the 1980s. Yeah. Were phenomenal under, under Darby's name and senior and Carl, you can go over those legends, but he is still, still took me across to an odd Saru control, the then Saru SA Cup final between Tigerberg and then Western province, which was basically a sort of so-called Muslim uh, union against Tigerberg, which was the sort of Cape Flats or Bel- yeah, Belleville area-based um, Christian, which was open warfare. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it was you know, opened my eyes to that. So then I thought, okay, there's a bit much, bit more to playing. I was a very average player um, playing than playing for UCT, where I was studying, and I went off and joined Northern's Avonwood out in Elsie's River, and I played there, where I was sort of the only white guy for a year or two, mm. which is an eye-opener because I was used to... Um, Finish a game up at Varsity, as we call it, and re- go, you know, putting your tie on, going to the pub and you know settling in for six or twelve of whatever many beers it was, six quiet ones and six noisy, <laughs> twelve noisy ones, and then uh, and then. Uh, but then these blokes would finish playing out of the Aussie River and they'd be getting their overalls to go into the night shift. Wow! And I sort of realised more more of rugby. Um, then I played a bit of in places like Italy and Portugal, and um, finished up at Varsity. I was I was. I was still quite competitive, but hopeless. So I was down then when my, you know, was the end of my career. we have gone four three two one in terms of teams, then ducked down two three four. I was playing for the fourth team and um, didn't want to lose to False Bay Vets or something. So I became sort of started shouting and became a player coach. And then the first team coach got fired, and they called me up to the first team. And then about two weeks later, hmm. um, we beat Stellenbosch and Stellenbosch for the first time since 1961, which had nothing to do with me for two weeks. <laughs> you know, but still, I got the, the thing with coaching. You know, you take, you take it. Yeah, exactly. Run, and then I got into, I got, I got into coaching. It was never my intention. And what year was that, more or less? Oh, I know very well because we made T-shirts and everything. Uh, 2004. All right. You know, we sort of made I Was There T-shirts. It took three days to get back. From, it took three days to get back from Stellenbosch. Yeah. Uh, after we won, you know, because we, we we had a few that couldn't drive. And then Sunday, somebody opened a beer and you couldn't drive. And we got back on the Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great, and um, yeah, I mean that 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 group still gets together quite regularly, doesn't it? That that team. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing about um, yeah, the sort of amateur. You know, we've won a few trophies over the last years of province, but I've never been to a reunion. But the amateur teams, whether it's you know the villagers team that won the grand challenge in nine, or the SA club champs in nineteen seventy nine, will get together. The used to team we watched the seventy four in diversity. Nick Mallet's mob will get together seventy six in diversity. Sorry. Um, and I'll do, I'll do too, you know, I remember, I remember one of the playing Stellenbosch myself um, and, you know, it was quite a close game and the Stellenbosch guys were saying to each other, 
you know, boys, we have to beat them. Otherwise, they'll make T-shirts and remember it for 20 years, you know, which is true. <laughs> we won every 20 years. <laughs> yeah, I suppose when you come from uh, Stellenbosch or Grey College, yeah, winning is yeah, yeah. not really special. But uh, yeah. And that's part of the, the fun of it. And, and Jamie Roberts said to me earlier this year that uh, – what he was really enjoying about the Stormers setup uh, was the way you were professional, but you had instilled their sort of amateur values in the team. Uh, and I guess that's that's quite tricky in the modern era, given the pressures and demands in the professional world. Yeah, Craig, you've actually hit it on the head. It's, you live on the edge all the time because, as I say, those guys have reunions. They played for each other. The amateurs I'm talking about, you know, hard to go and do a day's work yeah. and then go to rugby shows the passion that you've got for the game. You know, people wouldn't do that anymore. Uh, well, don't do that. You can see the numbers of you know uh, declining all over the. You know, I think New Zealand only got a few hundred club rugby players. So um, you know, but you got there was so much good. You know, the way they respected people, they appreciate amateurs. I'm talking about. So if I try and do that in the professional era, you've got to try and balance it. So the professionals, but you know, amateur guys would go and have. You know, they, they loved each other enough after a game to go and have, you know, a few drinks or Fantas in the bar together. Mm. And if you push that now, people go, oh, that's unprofessional. You should be recovering, you know. So it's it's okay. it's an old thing. It's okay when you're winning or doing well. But it is something I try and actively work on. I think a lot of rugby, rugby is differentiated from other sports. It's almost, rugby's future is almost in the past, if that makes any sense. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. Because that makes you get off the ground. You know, if I love Craig Ray, I'm lying on the ground stunned after making a tackle. I think I love Craig. I'm getting up. I'm going again. Yeah, it's that'll get you off the ground to my mind better than a contract, or uh, I don't know, I might be wrong. But. Yeah, we hate to use war metaphors, but it's a tough, tough physical game that yeah. you you have to rely on the guy next to you to take a lot of pain that you're taking as well, don't you? Yeah. And that's kind of at amateur level, you're only doing it for the guy next to you. At pro level, obviously, there's a bit more at play, but it's the same mindset that's needed. Yes, I can. Uh, that's my whole hypothesis. It's not always right, you know. We played the blues and got pumped. Few weeks ago, and watching the, a month ago, and watching it again, we just didn't work for each other. So mm. it doesn't always come off. But I still, I still think that the the the, the, the principles very. And I think the principles sound. Um, you're not going to to go. Otherwise, you go into every professional club. It's absolutely vanilla. Uh, you yeah, know, train, recovery, home, PlayStation. Train, recovery, home, PlayStation. And I'm not sure that's good for the players or the evolution of the game. Yeah, and uh, we've been through many years where professional teams. As you've just described, they just disappear. They don't engage. Yeah. They don't do any community work. Your 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 players seem to be really engaging, and you've spoken about uh, the feeding program through through yeah. um, pick and pay that you guys are getting involved in. But there's another really interesting project that you've start, that you got involved. You started using Johnny Clegg's song "The Crossing" as yeah. as a bit of a gear building thing in the team. I remember just thinking. Uh, Oh, you know, music is a great unit because it takes it's a great team build. It takes guys out of their comfort zone, and I just thought it's, you know, it's a great, something different from rugby. And then I'd seen that amazing tribute video with Jesse Clegg and you know Corrin Zoid and Francis van Kogh, all done a few years ago. And I thought, okay, mm. well, let's just try and do something similar as a team build, just as a team build. Nothing, nothing more than that. Just get the guys into a room. Let's learn the song properly. We got a guy from the Cape Town Choir, Leon, um, come in and sort of teach us the chords and teach us, and it just became a sort of team song. You know, and the guys enjoyed it and. I played them. I gave them the whole story of Johnny Clegg and what he'd done for this country and what a giant he was. And there's that magic one in Frankfurt when Nelson Mandela appears on the stage. And it just, you know, it was a nice feel good after the World Cup to try and yeah. keep it going. And then I, sp- I spoke to a guy called Duncan Crookshank who helps our sponsors and helps us with um, some marketing. And, that. and I said, amazing if we could get these guys into the studio because they actually can sing it quite well. They're some really good singers. And Duncan said, leave it with me pretty much. What started out as a team building exercise quickly developed into an idea to record Johnny Clegg's The Crossing as part of the Stormers' campaign to connect with fans through music and not only rugby. The Academy of Sound Engineering in Cape Town was the scene of three days of buzzing activity as a host of South Africa's leading recording artists, guided by acclaimed producers RJ Benjamin and Heinrich Franz, took the Stormers' squad through the process. The acclaimed producer and singer jumped at the chance to take the musical lead on this project, but he had his reservations. Out of a 40-man squad, he was hoping to find five players who could meet his minimum singing standard. He was pleasantly surprised then to find more talent than expected at his first audition with the Stormers squad. And I was banking on maybe five guys being able to sing. We landed up getting 10. In fact, I think we're up to 12 now. 
you know. It's just it's just fascinating. You wouldn't so, think that. That's a high percentage. I, I think it's a pretty high percentage. Mm -hmm. um, so then for me, the idea was pair them up with some uh, celebrities and artists that I know can sing, actors, uh, singers as well, um, and try and see if we, we, we can make it work, you know. Um, I mean, some guys are incredibly musical. Mm. You know, I, you, you just don't know. You know, obviously, getting into a studio is next level. Yeah. Being able to just sing in front of me is one thing. Yeah. Once you're standing in the studio, there's a lot of pressure. Um, but so far, everybody's doing um, doing doing really well. Yeah. Giant Lock JD Schickling was surprised that his voice got the nod from R.J. Benjamin, but like a true competitor, he didn't let an opportunity to go to waste in his duet with comedian and singer Mark Lottering. I still can't believe that they actually chose me to, to do a lyric or something like that. Um, but, uh, I mean, what an amazing experience and taking us a bit out of our comfort zone. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's awesome. The second rower, who five years ago survived a broken neck that came within a millimeter of paralyzing him, revealed that this project was more daunting than playing rugby. But as part of the Stormers' ethos in 2020, it was also a chance to do something different for fans across the country. So what's harder, standing in front of 50,000 people playing rugby or singing in front of 10 people staring at you? Uh, <laughs> probably 10 people staring at me. <laughs> and the song, just why is it so special to the storm? Um, so basically, we also have this thing, um, Get Cape Town Smiling, and I think the song is also about getting people smiling and um, getting them together. So I think that also slots in a lot with um, our culture and what we want, want to achieve. The renowned comedian brought some laughs to proceedings with his brand of infectious humor and perfect timing. A nervous shickling was put at ease by the veteran performer, who in his own inimitable way declared that it was his own skill that made him less nervous next to the two-meter-tall shickling. On a serious note, though, the experience gave Lottering a chance to rediscover Johnny Clegg's music as he prepared for the recording. I have enjoyed the experience indeed. It's a... Um now, because obviously this morning and last night I was listening on repeat to Johnny Craig, mm. and that um, is largely in itself a very beautiful part of the experience. You know, just a reminder of of um, how much he means to us, and then that reminder that you don't want that he's not here anymore. But what a legacy! So that that for me was just beautiful listening to the song on repeat again and just remembering. Amy Chessink is a tiny force of nature. The former voice competitor has a big vocal range and an infectious zest for life. Her bubbly and warm personality made an awkward situation for the less gregarious Stephen Kutsoff a memorable and positive experience. A self-confessed Stormers fan, Amy jumped at the chance to record a Johnny Clegg song, which holds so much meaning for her. Got this amazing opportunity. I know you love the Stormers. Like, let's get together. We're trying to do something great and unite people with music and sports. So then, yeah, he's like, Do you want to do it? I was like, Yes, I live up the road from the studio. Yes, please put my name down. <laughs> and yeah, now we're here. And Johnny Clegg songs, have you done any of those in the past? I have actually done. So, this particular song that we're singing was my last song that I sang on The Voice before I left. So, it's actually a really special song, and it was around the time that Johnny Clegg died. And you know, so like, it's just, it's a very special song. Alongside the Hulk in Kitsoff, Amy looked like a small child, but it was the diminutive singer who had to do the cajoling and leading in this environment. Kitsoff, who is by nature a quiet man, had to really leave his comfort zone for this project. He is much more at ease with a ton of weight driving through his neck in a scrum against the All Blacks, but Amy was always there to give him much needed motivation. <laughs> One, two, three. You played in the World Cup. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's the like okay. Okay. okay, so Stephen, um, <laughs> let's give it a couple of goes yeah. until you feel until you feel comfortable. Level wise in your uh, in the headphones, you're happy. Yeah. Working. Okay, let's go. One, two, three. Here we go. <laughs> Despite getting through the recording unscathed, the stand-in Stormer skipper revealed that at school he was politely told to leave the arts to others and to focus on his rugby. It might have been a sage career advice, but by completing his duet with Amy, Stephen overcame a personal barrier. It's a different nerve. Uh, I don't always trust my singing voice or um, actually talking voice to be honest. I make a lot of mistakes, but 
Uh, it's an incredible experience singing with Amy and she's an incredible um, artist and such a beautiful voice. She's got an amazing voice, isn't she? She's so little and this big voice voice booms out of her. No, 100%. No, she eats that high notes, learn it, whatever you want from her, she she does it. It's amazing. Do you sing a lot? Um, in the shower and in the car, yeah, when <laughs> no one can hear me. Did you ever sing a choir at school or anything? No, I was uh, chased away day one, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Stick to rugby. Cause yeah, <laughs> I was uh, asked uh, friendly, ask friendly to just stay with rugby and st keep away from the odds. Scrum off, Herschel Giantes exploded onto the international scene in 2019, which culminated with an appearance in the World Cup final in Yokohama. But singing with Paxton Phillies was as nerve-wracking as anything he has done on a rugby field. The 2017 Idols winner, though, made him feel at ease. And like the true competitor that he is, Giantes took on the challenge, and after some nervous opening moments, he settled into the task admirably. Yeah, I think I was more relaxed for for the, the start of the Super Rugby than I was for this now. Um, but it's nice, it's a nice challenge, um, and it's nice to work with people you only see on TV. Yeah, um, yeah so it was nice. Um, Have you seen Paxton before? Okay. Yeah, I saw at the Curry Cup final, I think, yeah. but I've never met her before. Okay. Yeah, um, and obviously seen her on TV, idols and stuff. You looked a little nervous there. Yeah. <laughs> In the beginning I was, but yeah, to the end part, I, I started, the nerves started dying. I mean, this video, everybody I've showed to, it's brought tears to their eyes. And these are incredible people from the South African music industry. Um, Martin Myers, or Roddy Quinn with his support, um, the Academy of Sound, and everybody just joined in. And the artists, you know, um, Zelani, from, who used to be from Freshly Ground, I said Francis Van Koch, I mean, just uh, um, RJ Benjamin, the producer, everybody. Sia embraced it, you know, beyond embraced it. You know, he's a, he visibly moved by the whole thing. And... Nobody even hears it. Johnny Cleggs, um, I don't know what the instrument's like, a straight saxophone. Dan Shoulder, they all, they all came in. Not a, Josh Hawk, I mean, everybody just came in and helped us record this, uh, and we did it. And it's going to be launched probably later, I think it's later this week. And it's, you know, it was meant as a sort of, you know, showing more, they're more to rugby players and appreciating the history of South Africa and showing the future and building on the World Cup from the other perspective. But now, given what's going on in the country, it's going to be very powerful, you know, this crossing from our period of, morning hopefully into a period of growth and that's what it's about it is and uh the video will be coming out and and hopefully um you know we'll be sharing those links to uh, through our platforms because it really is um yeah it's goosebump stuff and I, I saw a preview of it today and i i i, I had tears in my eyes so it yeah. was it was beautifully done and yeah. as you say some of the guys started off really tentatively and they opened up and they relaxed and it, yeah uh, and i guess you know one or two of them herschel jainchis was one he he's played in a World Cup final, but he looked more nervous <laughs> in the studio. Yeah. And he actually said he was more nervous initially. And then he, he relaxed. So yeah. that taking them out yeah. of their comfort zones has got to be a good thing in rugby terms as well, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, you want the guys to really get to know, to trust each other. Otherwise, rugby, we, it's very much about the facade, you know, and we're tough. And it's got a lot of, perhaps that's the bad part of the old school values, you know, you don't engage. And especially now today's era of, of the over the overreach of digital devices and stuff like that um it's it makes even despite that the, you can communicate faster and better our interaction and our commu inter communications poorer and poorer i know this generation Z, the we get told the longest team meetings should be uh, 10 to 12 minutes it's down from maybe 35 minutes a few years ago so um mm. yeah, a decade ago whatever it was so we have to, we can make more meaningful interaction is really, really important. The guys would rather on a bus, they'd rather get a WhatsApp from Craig Ray sitting three rows in front of me than talk to the guy next to them. And that's the challenge. And that's why taking them out of the fish, I've taken them out of their comfort zone, forces them to, so they can't really hide or facade or be, be on their phones. So it strips them down. I don't want to be too crude about it, but it strips them down a little bit, you know. And, um, you know, I can't, I, yeah, I find it tough singing and going, right? Sure, but, uh, yeah. That's just what, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's got a powerful galvanizing effect on the, on the group games, you know, each other a bit, bit, bit better. So on Friday nights before games, we don't do any rugby stuff. It's all whether it's, you know, um, uh, uh, they've got to prepare an acapella or they've got to enact a scene from a movie or something like that. You know, just something that gets them laughing and closer to each other. I think it's important. But you've, uh, you've got a bit of a track record in that. Didn't you produce a play in the 80s that was quite political? Something about Tutu. <laughs> Uh, a couple, a couple, but uh, tell, tell, pick up the story. <laughs> that's, no, that's, yes, I blush a bit with that. The, um, Duncan, actually, the guy helping this was involved. 
The first one was called Too Too Much, <laughs> and it was about. Uh, listen, I'll probably get I'll probably get some of this wrong now, but um, the Archbishop of Cape Town always used to be the uh, was the um, the chairman of the College Council of Bishops when I was at school because my dad taught this. So I got it for free. <laughs> yeah, we, we couldn't afford the petrol to go to Ron about. I don't think. But the, um, <laughs> the, um, suddenly, the Archbishop Tutu became the Archbishop of Cape Town. And you could sort of sense the reaction amongst, you know, so-called white liberal society that we're not going to, the chairman of the college council is going to be a black fella. Yeah. And so that's what I call the play Too Too Much was about the reaction of the sort of Bishop's Court set and uh, Constantia set uh, <laughs> to, to this. How did that go down? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did, uh, look, I, I, it, 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 <laughs> I, I think that one scene where Tutu tries to sort of steal some silver from their house. As a joke to sort of, <laughs> as a joke to, <laughs> so to live up to the paradigm, you know, of the evil archbishop, which we're, we're yeah. And then I did a follow up called "It, uh, Tri- it to Trevor" about his son. I don't know if you remember Trevor Tutu was causing a bit of trouble. Uh, he was in trouble a few times, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a cheap and easy target, but you know, as a society I grew up in, when it was you know us white English speaking who were, you know, used to vote for the PFP but hope the Nets won, you know, and it's sort of taking a pop at that sort of mindset. And your and your two novels, <laughs> Year of the Gherkin yeah. and Year of the Turnip, yeah, and I mean, your, your character in that book is a little bit of a caricature of that sort of person you're talking about. Yeah. So Jason Bryden, your character your, your character in, in, in those books, The Year of the Turnip and The Year of the Gherkin, he seems to be a bit of a metaphor for <laughs> the sort of average 80s kind of um, white South African in that part of town. Yeah, I mean, that was that was the idea was to sort of satirize myself and my mates on two fronts, one of which is our rampant materialism, hedonism, which maybe generations before us haven't uh, didn't experience. And like, um, you know, he, like, for example, Jason Bryden wouldn't buy a polo shirt if it didn't have the horse on the outside because I was not. What's the point? Nobody would know it's polo. So um, there's no point in buying it. It's the same thing. So, <laughs> yeah, that materialism. Uh, and then just about, I suppose, I don't know, really two, yeah, white, failed, some circles of white population failing to appreciate the miracle and the generosity that we've been through in this country. You know? So like one of the guys in the book is, um, I think his name's Dorsey, goes off to um, a youth day a youth day celebration in Langa. And like his mates, what the hell are you doing there? Can't you come to the bride? The only rice, rice crispy amongst the cocoa pops. You know, <laughs> youth day is a day to bride, you know. So um, <laughs> it's to plagiarize, you know, it's not plagiarize, it's to satirize that, that thinking and try and sort of sensitize people that we, yeah, we become a bit more aware of those things in a humorous way. I mean, it's, it's very pop and light and quick and easy to read. Sure. But, but on that, on that note, uh, there's a serious issue at play uh, with coronavirus, and I know, uh, you know, we we don't want to get too political, but but it really is maybe a, a line in the sand moment. It's it's highlighting the sort of the difference between the haves and the have-nots. You know, expecting yeah. people to lock down in townships and that yeah. is almost impossible, and it, it's maybe bringing home for a lot of middle-class South Africans the plight of how many South Africans the way they're living. And maybe that's one good thing that might come out of this, that people are more aware of the circumstances of, of those less fortunate th- than them in this country. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, you know, I listened to Cape talk and the the people complaining about their dog walking. Mm. Uh, it just, you know, yeah, it was, and I want to walk the dog, but I mean, cheapest. Yeah, or complaining that, oh, they saw a taxi and it was full. <laughs> the people are trying to get to work in an essential service by definition. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, I couldn't agree with you more. And that, you know, I don't know what the the verb is or the noun is for the reverse of globalization, and I think that's one of the that's one of the consequences. But definitely, I think greater sensitization. I mean, I, I know it's burning. You know, there's nobody to do the ironing and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> it's 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 going to be good for us. And and some of the yeah you know, the chat groups, you just see some of the complaints. I mean, <laughs> I, we digress, but in our in our community, there's a, the usual Facebook group and. And some of the people are complaining that the eight o'clock applause for the health workers is a bit too late. Could we do it at seven? Because our children are going to go to sleep. And you just like, you cannot believe that people <laughs> that people are living in such a bubble. And and hopefully, if the one good thing comes out of coronavirus, is that people are actually just wake up to their their, their privilege. I couldn't agree with you more. But yeah. we've digressed far enough away from the, the subject of rugby. But speaking of rugby, you have got to get back on the field at some point. Yeah. Hopefully this year. There's a good possibility, Dobber, that the, the season might be cancelled, which would be a tragedy for for several reasons, not least 
is Newlands' last sort of year in existence as as the venue for Western Province rugby. A couple of weeks ago, it was being talked of that you know we get behind closed doors, whether that's in May or June, you know, so before the lockdown in May, June, or July, and play a domestic uh, version of Super Rugby because the various rights, you know, broadcasting and sponsorships from Vodacom and that, and that we, you know, sort of got mm-hmm. that made a lot of sense. But I think what's become clearer is that I don't think Super Rugby is going to return in the as we know it. Uh, I think. You know, just not only the financial impact of the virus, but, uh, you know, just people hopping on planes to countries across the world and that sort of thing. I just think it's in a, in a, in a, in a, in a competition that was bleeding out. Um, I, 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 I'm pretty convinced. I don't know what our landscape, but I think there's going to be a dramatic reset. So from, a, from, the, from the, the super reggae point of view, you know, it was from this, just narrowly from this tournament, it was, it was actually turning into a, a nice tournament. You know, the Sharks had done incredibly well. We had a game in hand, still had to play them at, at DHL Newland. So it was, you know, it was game on. It was exciting times. But um, obviously, that's, that's well and truly over now. You know, if there was a new competition, I suspect we'd start from fresh anyway. Because, you know, if you just factor in the local teams, um, let's say um, you said that a storm is you, you played four because we played the Lions, the Bulls, and the Sharks, sorry, three. Or, you know, and um, you've won two, and the Sharks, you played, three, you know. Then the competition becomes too short if we take out three of the games. If you only got four teams in the thing, so I accept that that that, that this year's Super Rugby, as we know, it's dead. And um, the the concern for us would be Newlands, especially with a Test match. You know, it's hard to see. I certainly I would have thought George it's hard to see Scotland coming. Mm. Uh, and then I think we'll still be able to control it in you know a last hurrah at Newlands. You know, whether that's a game against the World Fifteen or Barbars in mm-hmm. October, November. I cannot see us just sort of. Even if it's later, you know, can't see us slipping into the night. It's not like Investec are moving in tomorrow to build townhouses and saunas. You know, I think we've got a bit of time. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think I do think it's um, there will be a farewell. Um, obviously, our dream was you know to be Super Rugby playoffs. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, whether there's a stronger Curry Cup, great, but I'm not sure how you fit that in with the need to make revenue off the internationals. Yeah, I mean, my like Nirvana would be um, you know we did the Super Rugby thing to get. You know, to support the rights, uh, Vodacom and Supersport, like three, three, um, you know, three double round. The, so the six, six games, and then semi, the no semi final because you really only got four teams for the final. And then if there's a little uh, gap in travel windows, which I can't see happening, you know, the Australian, New Zealand, they could play a semi final, and the Argentinians could have a free knock into it for Super Rugby. I think that's very unlikely. And then have a really good Curry Cup and push the Rugby champ- Championship back to you know October, and then you could still go on the end of year tour. But that's my wish list. I don't think it's, I think there are much more practicalities like the need for the, the revenue of um, uh, maybe the Scotland test. Oh, Craig, can you see it happening? I don't know. I can't see it happening. I can't see it happening in June anyway. No. I mean, I was a bit disappointed anyway that Newlands had got, uh, with all due respect to Scotland, a fairly low profile farewell test and not an All Blacks or something as its final hurrah. So yeah. it would be very sad if Newlands didn't host another test match. There's strong rumours that, that we are going to, it's a rugby recognised what you've just said. I mean, I don't know that factually, but um, that we will play a test at Newlands. Hmm. Yeah, it would be great if they could get the All Blacks for a one-off out of rugby championship game or something. But yeah, I mean, we, I suppose in in this in this climate, we got to, whatever we can get, we'll take at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Dobbo, just uh, you know, in in terms of uh, your your contract, was it only for this year, if I recall, or my under correction there? Um, it was... No, you're thinking of Puerto. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, but 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 I mean, you've lost. You basically lost the season of of proving yourself at this level as well, which is yeah. from a pure Really personal and selfish point of view, I suppose that that must be a little disappointing for you as well. Yeah, I mean, we're very, I was very excited about this season. Um, yeah, and 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 to to go off into the night, you know, to, to go gently into the night based on two losses is not great because yeah, you know, people with sport, that's what I've learned is the emotion. You know, I didn't think we were as good as we, we said we were in those first four games, mm. and I didn't think we we're as bad as everybody says we are now. You know, um, but. Um, it's a tale of a disappointment, you know. If 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 we got, you know, we wouldn't have reserved it. it would have been an absolute great, absolute heist if we'd won in Durban. But let's say, for example, that penalty against Scarra, which um, in the seventieth minute, which Kerwin Bosch knocks over to get the lead. Mm-hmm. If we'd held on, got the penalty there ourselves, going to their twenty-two and burgled it, we wouldn't be going through the same sort of learning and introspection we are now. But it would be much more pleasant for us because people do literally, as Doc Craven said, judge you in your last game. So yeah. to slip off like this is very disappointing. And those injuries, I just can't account for five of the six. Um, 
when we do get to the field again, if the, if, it, if 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 Springboks are available, we'll be a strong team because everybody will be back. But it's it's been massively disappointing because I think we still had it. You know, we still, as I said, we had a game in hand. Let's say we hyped, we won it, and the Sharks came to New It'd be a great occasion. Yeah. You know, and then the winners at the top of this wins the table have been brilliant. And so to leave it like it is on a negative note with those two results, very, very disappointing because we actually put a lot in and we try to do a lot to reset the culture around our team and to embrace Cape Town. That's like this year as a project and getting Cape Town smiling was our theme for the campaign because I think the most important thing in rugby period in the Southern Hemisphere is getting people back in the grounds. I don't mean that in context of the virus. But yeah, because surely at some stage, a guy, Sky, whoever buys TV rights with his goatee in his earring, go think, there's 3,000 people in the AMI stadium. I can't pay these rights, yeah. what they're asking. You know what I mean? Where, how does it feel played Stoke? It's something to watch. Yeah, I think that's an underestimated thing is how grounds look on TV. I know TV is a separate thing, but it, but it, it all comes back to the package. And if the ground's empty, TV feels dead. And... As you say, that's going to affect the price, the tag that someone's willing to pay, surely. We've, we've relied on this thing that uh, there's the TV money. It's like it's completely separate. But I think at some stage, as you suggest, they've got to come together. Mm. And people are going to say, this is not a product. You know, I don't know if you remember, I used to watch domestic cricket a bit in the, you know, when there was still, and you, there's nobody at the ground. And you think, earlier, oh, yeah, when we used to be on TV, I'm wasting my life. Yeah. Nobody's going to the ground to watch it. You know, what are you doing at home watching? Yeah, it absolutely feels wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it feels wrong, yeah. And it's getting that same to the Super I mean, you probably remember, as, as I do, there were some days we watched, you know, we started with the Crusaders game at 8 o'clock, yep. rugby, you know, about 12, you got the whole day. You didn't miss one of the Super Rugby games for the weekend. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Super 12 was, to me, the ideal. 100%. Um, yeah, that, that was, that's, I think, where it was at its zenith. Yeah. But um, times have moved on. And for you guys... Uh, even worse, you, you weren't going to have another drink after you, to your next win. <laughs> and then, you, and then uh, you lost to the Sharks and you're going to lockdown. So yeah. are you still sticking to that no drinks since your last win? Jeepers, it's most since I was 16. Uh, I've been the driest. <laughs> or 18 officially. But the, um, of course. Uh, I'm sticking to it. But um, I think maybe the end of lockdown may cause a party. So I didn't go and panic buy or stock up. So uh, even if I wanted to now, to <laughs> you can't really have a drink. <laughs> so I'm going to the, I'm going to the shops and then to get something that I deliberately don't get what I went for, so I can tell my wife I can go back again. <laughs> it's a funny time we're living in Doba. It's been a great pleasure having you on, and I mean we've had a lot of fun, and there's a lot of stuff we can talk about. But yeah, good luck with whatever, whenever you get back on the field in whatever shape or form it is, and. Uh, yeah, I suppose it's just about keeping the players motivated and fit during this weird time for you. Exactly those two words, motivated and fit. We work, I think we've got a pretty good program and we're interacting with them a lot. So I'm pretty convinced that we, yeah, but it's that, exactly motivated and fit. And we have to make sure, I think, you know, after what happened in those last two games, we get back on the field, we have to be in a position to win what's, you know, because I think anything else by this group of players would be an underachievement. So it's a massive challenge for us. Looking forward to it. Thanks for extending check, Craig. Anytime. <laughs> Come back on the Maverick Sports Podcast when you're ready. That's John Dobson. Thanks so much for joining us today. This podcast is made possible by our Maverick Insiders. Please consider becoming part of our Maverick Insider community, where for a nominal fee every month, you are supporting quality independent journalism. You also get some cool benefits such as Uber vouchers when the coronavirus pandemic subsides and engagement with our journalists thrown in. Please go to dailymaverick.co.za forward slash insider to sign up and become part of the Maverick Insider community. Also remember to sign up to our Maverick Sports newsletter, which hits your inbox on a Monday and never miss another podcast by signing up via your favorite platform. I'm Craig Gray. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Yeah.